sometimes we just need a little bit more encouragement, right? Man, Jesus, I just thank you so much that you reign. I thank you for the peace that surpasses understanding. I thank you for the joy set before you that you endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God so that we could live in confidence knowing that you rule from a seated position. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, you guys good? Man, thank you, worship team, as always. Amazing. Aren't they something special? Isn't it really cool to hear guitars when there's no guitars on stage? <laughs> you didn't notice that, did you? Until I just brought attention to it. Technology. You good? Are you sure? Are you sure? Yo, I get to preach one of my favorite sermons ever. So I'm going to need some energy to help me because if you don't have energy, I'll have enough energy for both of us. My kids were good this week. <laughs> it helps that one of my kids had major surgery, so he was like unconscious half the week. <sighs> but he's healthy and good. <laughs> if, you, if you follow me on social media, I posted that little uh, love note that my daughter wrote my son while he was gone all day, and that just touched my heart so much. I was like, oh, you guys do love each other when you're apart. <laughs> and then if you're raising kids, you know, come on. It's nice to see those glimpses. <laughs> I've been holding on to that all week ah, because they hate each other a lot. Thank God for a fun church. You guys good? Hey, welcome to Hill City Church. My name is Corey. I'm part of the teaching team. We've been in this series that I get to close today titled, When the Greatest Doubts. And today I get to talk about Thomas, my favorite disciple to talk about. You're going to find out real quick why I get to talk about Thomas and why it's my favorite to talk about. Now, I preached a very similar sermon about two years ago in our sermon series called uh, Things, or, or no, yeah, I never said that. Things that Jesus never said. Do you remember that? You probably don't remember that. It's okay if you don't remember it. But we, un we unpacked a lot of things that people believe in church that Jesus actually never said. And one of the things that Jesus never said was that doubting is dangerous. I heard that my whole life from well-meaning pastors. It was like, your doubt is dangerous. Just believe. Just pray about it. And that didn't help. Okay. And so we decided that it was going to be really important for us as a church to recognize that we need to talk about doubt and take off the shame and condemnation that we have when we doubt. And notice I said when, not if. <laughs> okay. Because as a pastor, I want to admit to you, I doubt all the time. All the time. And, and I don't think that doubt is a bad thing. And you're going to see why. Now, I'm going to unpack a lot of scripture today, okay? So if you care about this thing like I care about this thing, we're going to unpack this thing. But I do want to remind you that the Bible is not the foundation of Christianity. Jesus is. <laughs> okay. In my opinion, if you don't doubt, you don't grow. Because if you don't doubt, that means you're not asking questions. Or you've been shamed to ask questions, therefore you stopped asking questions and you just live in turmoil by yourself. And you were never meant to do this thing called Christianity by yourself. Okay. If something cannot be questioned, it can't be trusted. Okay. Some of you won't be able to uh, fully understand or grasp what I just said. But maybe you'll pick it up on your way home. Cool. When the greatest doubts. So this is week three. Talking about Thomas. Week one we talked about. John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest man ever born of a woman. And I unpacked the fact that he was born, according to Scripture, with the Holy Spirit within, which is a crazy revelation because that means that John the Baptist was one of, if not the only one, born in the old covenant with a new covenant reality because the Holy Spirit didn't fall until Acts chapter 2. Actually, you're going to find out that Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit on his disciples after the resurrection before Acts chapter 2, which is kind of cool. We're going to unpack that too. Cool? All right. Then Mikey brought a word last week. Oh, my gosh. Did Mikey bring a word last week or what? Mike, you got four golf claps, and I know Valhalla's got golfers here this week, but that was weak, y'all. She talked about this idea, not only uh, talking about John the Baptist, but the reality that oftentimes we doubt ourselves. We're going to talk about that again, too, because I thought it was so good. I think I need to piggyback it. Because in the counseling world, Linda and I, we, d we deal with a lot of people who doubt themselves. 
And I would argue that doubting yourself is a learned habit. Which means if it's a learned habit, it can be an unlearned habit and it can be replaced. You should not doubt yourself because you have the King of Kings, the Holy One living within you. (laughs) You should be confident enough to be able to understand that you have the Spirit guiding you to be able to make good decisions in your life. It's good, it's good. You ready? Okay, remember, this series that we're talking about doubt, it was not designed to make all of your doubts disappear. It wasn't even designed to give you all of the answers to the questions that you have about God, the Bible, and Christianity. Okay? Our goal, and specifically my goal as I close today, was to help you understand that faith is an adventure and doubt is a part of it. You are not alone in your doubt. In fact, you are welcome here when you doubt If you don't know what you believe, man, you found a good place to find home, to call home, not find, yep, all of that. Cool? All right. You ready? We're going to unpack a lot of scriptures. Doubt. Four times in scripture, Jesus tells his disciples, you of little faith. You know that? Well, you know what's unfortunate about the Bible is you don't read tone in the Bible. And then you have these translators who translate things, and it's a dead language, so they're translating things that don't often make sense. That's why there's a lot of different translations of the Bible. It's because people uh, see different things throughout the language of the Bible, and then they interpret it differently, and I don't think that they're necessarily wrong. I think that that's just how Dagon hard Greek is. None of my Bible nerds are laughing at that, which means you haven't suffered through Greek. Okay. Because in seminary, they make you go through four semesters of Greek, and it was the worst four semesters of my life. And now I have BibleHub.com. Okay. (laughs) Only a couple people are laughing at that. That means you actually fact-checked us, which, as pastors, I encourage you to do. Don't just take my word for it. You have the same spirit that lives in me. If I say something that you might disagree with, that is a great opportunity for you to take it to the spirit and decide what is true for you. You don't have to believe everything we believe to belong here. Did you know that? And I'm not making you feel like you have to believe and live according to what I say God says in your life. (laughs) Because that's manipulation. And that's not the spirit of Father. So he tells, he tells his disciples four times, you have little faith. It's actually a, um, what's it called? A metaphor. Did you know that? You have little faith. We read that and we're like, oh man, he's, he's challenging dis- his disciples on their faith. It actually is a Greek phrase that means to not fully understand or to be dull to the moment. Man, I find encouragement in that. What do you mean? What do you mean? Jesus challenged his disciples not necessarily on their lack of faith, but their lack of understanding. Uh, yeah, because that's me every day. Come on, you guys aren't giving me enough feedback. Are you with me right now? The, the walk with Jesus doesn't always have answers to it, and that's frustrating. And I don't think that Jesus came here necessarily to give you all the answers to all the questions you have in life because life is a journey, and it's meant to not necessarily have answers, but to be walking with the Spirit So four times he confronts his disciples, you have little faith. It literally means to not understand. And I think that's a fair statement because John tells us in John 2.22 that the disciples didn't actually believe Jesus was the Messiah, get this, until after the resurrection. That means for three years that they were following Jesus, witnessing all kinds of crazy miracles. The disciples were doing this in their faith. And that encourages me. In fact, what I'm going to point out today is so day gone encouraging if you've been doubting. So stay with me. Ready? Okay. Let's go to one of those places where Jesus tells his disciples, you have little faith. It's actually one specific disciple. It's Peter. And it's found in Matthew chapter 14. And if you're a Bible nerd like me, you know what Matthew chapter 14 is all about. It's about Jesus walking on water, which is crazy. We believe a dude walked on water. Okay, I'll let that sink in. We believe some crazy things within the religious faith, and I think that's okay. (laughs) I believe it. If you don't believe it, okay. It doesn't happen very often. (laughs) So Jesus is walking on the water. You have the 12 disciples freaked out in the boat. Rightfully so, there's a dude walking on the water. 
Some of them thought it was a ghost. <laughs> that would have probably been me. Yo, yo, there's a dude walking towards us. What do you mean, Apostle Corey? <laughs> I mean, there's a dude walking on the water. So Peter sees this dude, ghost, thing, walking on the water, and he yells out, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come onto the water. This is where we pick up the story, verse 29. Jesus says, come. (laughs) Not a lot. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. So there are two dudes walking on the water. That's crazy. Can you imagine this perspective from the other 11 chumps who stayed in the boat? (laughs) Oh, man, there goes Peter. (laughs) Can you imagine that scene when he, like, he's climbing out? Like, no, don't don't do that. Don't do that. And then, like, oh, man, I should have done that. (laughs) It's so easy to walk with Jesus when all of your friends believe the exact same things because you're never challenged. And then when they do something that you disagree with and then you see that the Holy Spirit was involved in it the whole time, you're like, oh, man, I knew it. Should have done it. I'll let that one sink in. Then verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And he says, you have little faith. That sounds like belittling. That sounds like condemnation, doesn't it? Because we can't read tone into it, and when they translate these phrases, we read tone into it because it says you have little faith. How much differently would you read that if you read it in the Greek metaphor? Ready? Here he goes. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Do you not understand? Why do you doubt? Do you see the tone difference? Now, I can't read tone into it, but based on the metaphor, I certainly can. I don't think that Jesus was condemning Peter for his lack of faith in this moment, I think Jesus was trying to remind Peter, yo, I'm really that guy. But notice in this passage that Peter did not doubt Jesus. How can I say that? Because he asks one question, dude, if it's you, tell me to come. Jesus says come. And then he gets out of the boat. Do you realize how much faith someone has to have to get on a boat to do something that no other human can do? Then he does it, and he starts to panic, not because he's with Jesus, but because of his circumstances. Man, this sounds like me, y'all. And he begins to sink, not because he's doubting Jesus, but because he's doubting himself. So when Jesus says this metaphor, I don't even think he's talking about himself as the Son of God. I think he's trying to remind Peter, do you realize what is within you? For three years, I've been trying to teach you dudes about the power of Christ, the power of myself in you to impact people. Do you not understand what you possess? As if he's telling the 21st century American church, do you not understand your power? You don't need to do with a microphone to rely on the Holy Spirit from him or her. You need to wake up to the power that has been born inside of you. That's my job as a pastor is to remind you of who you have always been, awakened to Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you realize what you could overcome and accomplish in your own life if you knew who was with you through the process? I love this reminder. Why did you doubt? And then verse 32, check this out. And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him. Key word. Okay, we're going to come back to a different place where they worship. But then those who were in the boat, so all 12 dudes are worshipping Jesus. A duh. He just calmed the storm and he just picked up Peter. Have you ever thought about the revelation that Peter worships while wet? That means in his own shame and condemnation for sinking, he's able to overcome that because Jesus reminded him, do you know who you are? He worshiped while wet. Pull that verse back up there. Did I finish it? I might have finished it. Saying, truly, you are the Son of God, which is ironic because they doubt that that statement, truly, you are the Son of God. You know, they say that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I never did the math, but there's several areas in scripture where disciples are doing this in their faith and then they have a moment usually he's turning water into wine or he's walking on water he's doing something crazy that most humans don't do and they go truly he's the son of god 
And then guess what? Circumstances happen. (laughs) Are you sure you're the son of God? Yeah, watch this. Yep, truly, you're the son of God. And I got to be honest, that's encouraging for me. I don't know if that's encouraging for you. Okay. So let's go to uh, Thomas here. Where are my Bible nerds out? Who, what is Thomas known as? The doubter, doubting Thomas. Out of all the labels in all of the scriptures, I hate this label the most. The most. Here's why I hate it. What I'm about to unpack to you is, if you weren't here two years ago, uh, this will be new for you. If you were going to remember that, you might remember this from me teaching this two years ago. But if you actually study this passage that we're going to look at today, it doesn't make sense how Thomas gets labeled as a doubter. So when people call Thomas the doubter, it reveals to me something that that person actually hasn't read the story. You see how we regurgitate something we've been taught in church our whole life? And it's not actually true. Mind you, after what I'm about to read to you, Thomas is the disciple who goes further east than any other disciples. He goes all the way to India to preach the gospel. Doesn't sound like a doubter to me. Anyways, let me unpack this story. You ready? (laughs) My favorite thing. John chapter 20. Okay. Jesus has died. He's resurrected. He's shown himself to a woman, which is controversial. You do know that women had zero rights in this society, so why on earth would God show up to a woman to declare the good news that he has resurrected from the dead? But women, we're not going to go there. Verse 19 of John chapter 20, okay? Uh, Now, this is how I read the Bible, so forgive me. (laughs) On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, With the doors locked. Details, y'all. Are the doors opened or are the doors locked? If if you're inside a a door that's locked while you're awake, what's that reveal? Oh, did you read the rest of the sentence before I read it? When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Pause. Hold on. Uh, That Scripture is not entirely true because they left off one disciple, which you're going to find out in about five verses. There's one disciple that's not there. Actually, there's technically two disciples that are not there. You know, one of them is Judas. Obviously, he's not there. He did. That's said with reverence. There's another disciple who's not there. His name is Thomas. So mind you that. Now, we're going to read it so that you can see I'm not lying. But that's a big detail that is left out of this part of the story because not all disciples were there. (laughs) So you got ten dudes who are terrified. (laughs) Locked in a room. (laughs) Because if the Jewish leaders get a hold of them, they die. Why? Because the dude that they were following was crucified. Which means they were all living in blasphemy which means the penalty for their blasphemous claims was death. So they have every right to be living in fear. Now, we make fun of this situation. I'm making light of the situation. You better believe, if I'm one of the disciples in this moment, I am with them all. (laughs) Is that door bolted? (laughs) Okay, we're good? Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Pause. What? The door is locked. Okay. Okay. It's not Jesus doing more miracles, just showing up. She stood among them and said, key word, peace be with you. Uh, Easy for Jesus to say. Okay, grace. (laughs) I'm freaking out, God. Yeah, peace be with you. That doesn't help. Okay. After he said this. He showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed. Keyword, underline that. Overjoyed when they saw the Lord. You would be too. I would be too. Okay, so we're in fear. We're locked the door. Jesus shows up. What? Jesus says, yo, it's me. They're like, no way. Overjoyed. Right? You would be too. Okay. I I want you to read it like I read it because there's some things that are going to be revealed to you today, especially if you doubt. Okay. Again, 
Jesus said, peace be with you. So I guess if you say it twice, it's good. That's funny, y'all. <laughs> Wives, if your husband needs to hear it twice, so did the disciples. <laughs> That's a joke. Men, pay attention better. You know my favorite line in Dumb and Dumber is when he's like, I don't know, she broke up with me because I wasn't really listening. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> okay. I love that line. I say it to my wife all the time. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whoa, check it. I was reading that this past week, and I thought that John was the only person. Nope. Before Pentecost, the disciples got the Holy Spirit, which is crazy, which is crazy. Verse 23. Actually, I have to focus on this verse for a minute because uh, this gets misquoted a lot. Uh, and with that, or, oh, pull it up. If you forgive someone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Keep this verse up. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, that sounds like all twisted and whack. The problem is, is the translators were so confused when they translated this verse because if you look up these words in the Greek, that's not what is being said. Those first two words that say the word forgive are the Greek words for forgive. The second two words that get translated as forgive are not the Greek word forgive. Do you know that? It's the Greek word retain. In other words, if you're not going to forgive people's sins, they're retained on them. In other words, you should be forgiving people who harm you. And that's a process. That's a process. But when you don't forgive them, their sins are retained on them on their own conscience. Not from a spiritual place with the Father because Jesus says you have been forgiven from the foundation of the world. So is Jesus a liar? No. Are you forgiven? Yes. Are you permanently forgiven? Yes, but our calling as Christians is to forgive one another so that people don't live in the shame and condemnation of their own mind and own thinking. Okay, verse 24. This is where it gets juicy and good. You ready? Now, Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Okay? Key detail, told you, wasn't lying. Thomas ain't there. I love this part. Ready? <laughs> So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Pause. This is where Thomas gets labeled as a doubter. That's not fair. Why? Because they all saw the risen Jesus and are telling Thomas about an experience he did not have. If we have staff meeting tomorrow, and I am late, and I show up, and all the staff are like, yo, Corey, shouldn't have been late. Why? Because Jesus in the flesh showed up. <laughs> and he turned all of our water into wine. I'm going to be pretty ticked up. I missed that staff meeting. I almost said a really bad joke, so don't tell me I don't have self-control. I'm going to be like, unless he comes back and turns my water into wine, I ain't going to believe. And I think that that's a fair assessment. Okay, now you're as frustrated as I am with this story on why Thomas gets labeled a doubter. Okay, check this out. Verse 26. A week later, how many days? Seven. Seven days later, now all of them, all 11, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Okay, you got this experience? Next, next part of the verse. Some of you read before I read it. Though the doors were locked. Pause, hold on. Okay. So you mean to tell me? Let's move Thomas, okay? He hasn't had the experience. You mean to tell me that these 10 dudes who are locked in a room in fear have the risen Jesus show up and be like, yo, peace with you twice. And where are these chumps seven days later? In the same day gone room with the same door locked, terrified with fear. I don't know if you're as excited as I am, but that is very encouraging because for me, I am oftentimes locked in my own prison of my own doubt, wondering, where is God? He told me, he promised me, and I am frustrated. Oh, I love this. The funny thing is, is these 10 chumps convinced Thomas to stay with them in the locked room. 
So now Thomas is labeled a doubter, yet why wouldn't he be? The 10 other dudes who he's with now have not changed even though they have experienced the risen Jesus. Do you understand Thomas? I understand. I love this passage. You can tell why I get so hyped up, especially teaching young people about this, because young people, come on, this is part of the journey. Following Jesus is not about being secure in every aspect of your walk. Following Jesus is about trusting him in the process of what you do and don't believe. Oh, my goodness. Though the doors were locked a second time, Jesus came and stood among them. A second miracle. And he says it for the third time. So I guess three times is the charm. Peace be with you, y'all. I know I said it twice, but you still, seven days later, are locked in the same room, stressed out, full of anxiety, full of fear. And I love what Jesus doesn't say. I think what's more important than what Jesus says is what he doesn't say. But we're going to get to that. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe which is why he gets labeled as a doubter. You know what's interesting about that phrase, doubt? It's only used one other time in all of the scripture. Can you guess which scripture it's used in? We read it earlier. Matthew chapter 14, Peter walking on the water. You have little faith. Do you still not understand, Thomas? Do you know who I am? And do you know who you are because you know who I am? Verse 28 Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, which means because Thomas was doubting, and rightfully so, Jesus shows up without condemnation, without shame, and gives Thomas his own experience. Man, if you're doubting, peace be with you. Maybe God's going to show up in an incredible way that's unique to you and you alone to remind you that he is your champion without shame and without condemnation, to remind you of the power that you have always walked with. Then Jesus told them, because you have seen me and have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Man, that is incredible. That's incredible. Blessed are you who have not seen the physical resurrected Jesus and have believed. Mm. Ten dudes. Locked in a room, full of fear. Get an experience. Whoa, Jesus is amazing. We're overjoyed. So overjoyed. We're going to stay in this room for seven days with the door locked. Jesus shows up a second time to ten dudes, one time to Thomas. And Thomas is psyched, man. He's humped. He er, <laughs> hyped. I meant to say psyched. Yeah, it came out humped. That was weird. <laughs> we'll pause for some humor because I know some of you won't let me go. Dean's late. His uh, stomach hurts. All right. <laughs> Don't you put that on YouTube. <laughs> He's hyped. <laughs> Father, forgive me for they know not what they do. <laughs> Dang it. I was about to get somewhere good. Now I got to pause. All right, we're good. All right, you back? Okay, we're back. We're hyped. <laughs> Dean's gone forever, but we're hyped. All right. So the disciples got this experience. Now what I'm about to read, we have to jump over to Matthew chapter 28 because John does not record what I'm about to share with you. Only Matthew records what I'm about to share with you. And the reason for why, in my opinion, now I can't prove this, the reason for why I think John doesn't write this part is because maybe it was John who's guilty. <laughs> so the disciples, hyped, right? Jesus now giving them two, two risen experiences. Jump to Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says, hey, yo, uh, let's go to the Sea of Galilee and uh, I'm going to give you the Great Commission. He doesn't say that, but we say that because that's what we know from the Scripture. Because we have the whole story, right? Which is why we judge the disciples for their lack of faith all the time, because we know the story. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. This is after the resurrection. This is after these two experiences with Jesus. Okay, so 10 dudes have two. One dude has one. But they have an experience, right? It's pretty cool. We pretty hyped. We're overjoyed. Man, faith. Woo! We got it. We got it. Jesus is the Messiah. Facts. Yep, he's the Messiah. Mm-hmm. He's, he's it. Yep, he's the guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they go to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. I don't know why I'm waving back and forth like this. Okay. 
Verse 17, my favorite verse in all of Scripture. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Oh, come on, you guys didn't just pick up what I just put down? This is after two experiences. They're hyped, so hyped that they leave the locked room. That's a big deal, y'all. They leave the locked room. They show up on the Sea of Galilee. They're like, we know what we believe. We will worship you because we believe so much. Yet some of them doubted. (laughs) And I'm so encouraged by that. And I think that John didn't write that because John, the one that he loved, was like, are we sure? Because John 2.22 tells us that the disciples didn't actually really know that he was the Messiah until after the resurrection, even though they gave up three years of their lives to follow this dude. Which reveals to me, man, doubt isn't a bad thing. Doubt is a part of the journey. And they doubted. I love that. Just believe. Peace be with you. Yeah, but I'm doubting. Okay. Peace be with you. You know what I love about Jesus is what he does not say. Let's talk about it. Because Jesus then gives the Great Commission, which if you know the Great Commission is to go into all the world, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them the commandments, which is not the Ten Commandments. It's the only command John found in John 13, 35, the command to love as I have loved you, which is really, really simple. So if you don't know what you believe about God, and if you don't know what you believe about theology, and if you don't know what you believe about eschatology, and you don't know what you believe about pneumatology, and all these fancy words that most people in the church don't even know, they teach you in seminary to make you sound smart so that you think that I know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what you believe... You know, it's the greatest representation that you are a follower of Jesus or trying to figure out that you are a follower of Jesus is your knowledge of Scripture? Nope, 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 nope. Is your ability to have faith? No, it's your love for one another. Which is why I think Jesus says, peace be with you, because it's not so much what you believe, but rather is it inspiring you enough to love people, specifically people who don't look like, believe like, and vote like you. Because that's challenging. Man, you good? Was that good? Jesus, Jesus shows up to Thomas, and he gives him an experience. No shame. Jesus shows up to these disciples, and he knows that they're doubting while they are worshiping. No shame. Jesus doesn't say just believe. Jesus doesn't say just pray about it. Jesus doesn't say, hey, in Matthew chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, I taught you how to pray. Why aren't you doing that? See, none of those responses are helpful, so why in the church do we hear them? He tells them to go and love and empower people. Britt, you can help me close. What Jesus does when people shows, or when what Jesus does when people doubt is he shows up and gives you an experience, a personal one. And guess what? You may need several of them throughout your lifetime. Because the goal isn't necessarily to have this faith that's unshakable. This goal is to have a love that's unshakable. Because Paul told his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, he says, even if you're faithless, he remains faithful. What's crazy is if you actually pay attention to what that statement means, it means that the gospel does not demand you to have faith. The gospel supplies faith for you so that you can walk in confidence knowing that you are permanent in his eyes, permanently loved, permanently valued, permanently given God's faith for you. So if you don't know what you believe, man, welcome to the club. We're in this journey together. We're not supposed to leave this place with dogma because dogma only creates division, and division is not attractive. We follow Jesus because the best life is the Jesus life. What do you mean? You mean I don't have to keep trying out for a position I already have? What do you you mean? You mean I'm already loved even if I don't go to church, give, or serve? What do you you mean? I'm already qualified because of who Jesus is? That means that takes all of the responsibility not on you, but rather just to receive it. And when you receive it from a proper motivation, it brings responsibility back on you because you're coming from a place of fullness, not a place of lack. You work out your salvation. You don't work for your salvation. You don't even ask for your salvation. Because if you have to ask for your salvation, that puts the salvation in your court. And then that does not mean that Jesus is the Savior of the world. No, you pick up, you work out your salvation. Because when you understand you're working out your salvation, it produces a love for the people that we oftentimes look down on. Can't say you're a church that welcomes all if you don't actually welcome all. You can't say you're a church that welcomes all if you got a butt attached to it. 
because we're on this journey. And too many times we compare our journeys with each other. You might be on chapter three. You might be on chapter, I don't even have a chapter. And you're comparing your life with people who are on chapter 20 or in chapter 40, on chapter 60. And if we were honest, even those people in chapter 60 are like, yeah, my life's full of doubt. I've just maybe never been able to tell you that I am because I have to wear this mask in the church. Because I can't ask these questions. You should ask questions all the time. If you are actually reading the Bible, you should ask a lot of questions. You're safe here. Your doubts are welcome. Your questions are welcome. This is a journey. It's not about having all the answers to you. It's about journeying well. And I think that this is a safe place to journey well because I think it's really, really important for us to understand that we fix our eyes on Jesus, nothing else. If you don't know what you believe about Jesus, that's okay. He'll meet you where you are without shame and without condemnation. So, Father, I just thank you so much for faith in us. Even when we are faithless, you remain faithful. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that is within all of us. We just need to awaken to this reality so that we can do the things from a full place that you have called us to do. Father, I just empower your children here. I know there's a lot of dreams. There's also a lot of doubts. I pray that you remind them of their power this week in a unique and special way. You have never showed up in condemnation in people's lives. So I just pray that we rebuke any shame, any condemnation, any doubts as we journey this thing called life together. May you challenge us as Christ followers to give grace in every season of our life, especially to the people who don't know what they believe. We thank you for this empowerment. We thank you for these examples. We thank you for your love. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Corey, thank you. I really appreciate that encouragement. Wasn't that so good? I think um, for us just for a response, just in the natural to kind of convey what's taking place in the spiritual, I'm going to ask for everyone to just stand to their feet just for a minute. I was thinking about the story that he opened up with in Scripture today with Peter stepping out of the boat. And I love that revelation of he didn't doubt Jesus. He actually got down out of the boat and began to walk on water. But when he saw the wind and the waves, he began to doubt himself. And again, I read scripture a certain way too. And Corey was sharing the story and how I was picturing it was kind of what Corey was talking about, how when Jesus said, come and Peter's getting down out of the boat. I can only imagine the other disciples are like, dude, you're gonna, you're just gonna sink. You're like, come on, you idiot. Come on, you can't do that. And I just heard this word idiot. And then, then I remember later on uh, in Acts when the disciples are actually being sent out into the world, teaching about Jesus, sharing their experience. It says that they began to turn the world upside down and people couldn't understand what was happening in their city. And the, some of these city, city officials, you can read this throughout the beginning of Acts. It says that these, uh, these city officials and other people were looking at Peter specifically and they said these unschooled or untrained ordinary men will, are coming and turning our world upside down. That word unschooled or untrained, in the Greek, it's idiotes, idiots. But they were idiots because they didn't know what couldn't be done. And so I, just as a prophetic act, if we could just do, and I know we're all like limited with space, but if we could just step forward to say, yes, we trust in Jesus. Yes, we see Jesus. We have faith in him. But we're going to be, begin to also have faith and trust in ourself to have confidence in ourself because of the Jesus that lives in us. So if we can all just take a step, just a small step, to say we're going we're gonna to walk around knowing who we are. We already know whose we are, but we're going to know who we are as a son and a daughter. And that is what Jesus wants for us, sons and daughters who know who they are, who live confidently in the world. And that is what changes entire 
regions. It's what changes entire families. It's what changes workplaces. It's what changes schools. It's what changes relationships when you understand who you are and what you carry and the power that you possess because of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And I'm praying and believing for amazing things to happen in and through your life when you just, and I'm going to tie this back to the last series last month, begin to live in the flow of what the Spirit has for you. Because we're going to see amazing things happen. Amen. Amen. Well, don't forget this Thursday and Friday night at 7 o'clock, we'd love to have you out. The conference, it's going to be an amazing time, amazing worship. Baxter Kruger is going to be here. It's going to be so good. So we'd love to see you. But even if not, it's okay. I do hope to see you next Sunday. But until then, as you leave this place, know you're loved, period. And there's nothing you can do about it. See you all next week.